take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading, if you would, to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. We're going to read the first 12 verses of Psalm 73. And I realize some of you guys came from the game. You don't have your Bible with you. You may have your phone with you, and that's all right. If you don't have either one, just trust me, all right? <laughs> We're reading the right thing, amen? Psalm 73. We're reading responsibly as we normally do. We'll begin together on one and we'll alternate till we end together on verse number 12. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read God's word, all of us standing, and begin together on verse 1 of Psalm 73. Ready? Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? And let's finish with 12 together also. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this evening. Lord, thank you so much for the wonderful singing tonight. We've enjoyed the music very much, and it's ministered to our soul, and I pray it's been a blessing to you. And Lord, we're asking you that you continue to make our hearts ready that we, our hearts would be good soil that the Word of God would fall into and bring forth fruit in our life. And so, Lord, bless the special to that end and continue to allow our heart to be put in tune with your heart. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Why he came to save me 
Till someday I see his blessed face above No one ever cared for me like Jesus There's no other friend so kind as he No one else could take the sin and darkness from me Oh, how much he cared Good job, ladies. Now, our Father, we bow in prayer this evening as we come to the preaching of your word. Lord, I'm asking you to give us your help tonight, and I certainly need your help as I bring the message this evening. I pray, Lord, you'd help each one to give their careful attention to your word tonight, that, Lord, each of us would do our best not to let our mind be distracted and our thoughts go elsewhere. And we miss what you have for us this evening. Lord, though each of us are here, and we didn't know that these guests from the Bible College would be here, but you knew they'd be here. Lord, you must have something and something in mind for them in this service for them to be here. And I pray you'd help these fellows. I'm sure they're tired. I'm sure they've played today. And Lord, their thoughts could easily wander, as all of ours could. And I pray, Lord, for the next few minutes, you just help us to listen carefully and listen intently that we'd hear the still, small voice of the Spirit of God. And Lord, teach us your word this evening and help us to grasp this truth tonight that you taught Asaph in the 73rd Psalm. And I'll thank you now for what I believe you'll do. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you for a few minutes this evening from this 73rd Psalm about the prosperity of the wicked. You know, you can see in our day and age, and if you turn the news on at any time, you can see sometimes innocent people killed in drive-by shootings or terrorist attacks. You see people in our neighborhoods and sometimes good people. Uh, who end up with cancer or some debilitating illness. And while those who we don't look at as such good people live a party life or live a worldly life and kind of live for themselves and they seem to remain healthy. They seem to live, those who seem to live for money and things and themselves and they seem to get everything they want to get. They seem to have everything they want to have. And Christians struggle. It seems like they, they can do what they want and go on the vacations they want and, and get the things they want. And it seems like we fight and struggle for everything we try to get. You ever notice that? You think they, they seem to have it well and seem to go well. You walk into any church, it doesn't matter what church it is, and you look at the prayer list and it's filled with people with cancer and people with other illnesses and we're, we're praying for them and some are lost or some need a job and some are struggling in their marriage relationships. So we, we think of the temptations that bombard the Christian in the world, the things we have to say no to, the things we have to stay away from so we can maintain a, a relationship with God that we ought to. When it seems like those in the world don't have struggles at all. It seems like they just have it pretty easy. You ever think about that? Sometimes you just catch yourself saying it just doesn't seem to be fair. And by the way, life ain't fair. That's Hezekiah 3.8. But you're not alone. Yeah, some of you just got that, didn't you? If you're looking for it, don't look for it. Okay, you won't find it. Well, Asaph was thinking that way in Psalm 73. Asaph was the chief musician. He was kind of the choir director for David, King David. He was his music guy. And um, as he pens this 73rd Psalm, he couldn't understand why wicked men were prospering and the righteous were struggling. 
Why the wicked seemed to have it easy and the righteous had it hard. And it was confusing to him and he was getting a little upset about it and troubled and uh, perplexed about it and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit he penned the 73rd Psalm. Now no doubt he did it because God knew it wouldn't just be Asaph that struggled with this. It might be somebody else down the road like you and me. And so if he got help from this, maybe we'll get some help from this. And let's look at it together this evening, alright? Number one, I want you to see Asaph's condition. His condition. It's in the first three verses and he starts out, by the way, some, with something very good. Notice verse one. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. Well, he starts off good. By the way, well, what he just said is right. God is good. Okay? Uh, you hear people say all the time, God is good and, and uh, God's good and... Wh- how do you say that? God is good all the time and all the time God is good or something like that is what you say. And, and that's true. He's good to those who have a clean heart. So Asaph's reminding himself and sometimes you do that. You ever do that to yourself? Remind yourself that God's good. Remind yourself that God is uh, good to me and God has blessed me and God is right and uh, God is God and He is. He's all those things. He's saying, I know God's good, but he's saying I'm backsliding. I feel it. I feel myself beginning to go away from God. You ever felt that way? You ever feel yourself? You just know that I'm slipping? Look at verse 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He said, man, I I started going backwards. I'm sliding away from what I know to be true. Why? Verse 3. Because I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He started sliding backwards because his eyes were on the wrong people. He was looking at the wicked. He was looking at the people of the world and he wasn't looking at God. His eyes were on the world instead of God. He got envious. Envious envies that pain we feel when someone else succeeds or someone else has something that we wish we had. The truth is, envy says, I wish they didn't have it, I wish I had it. That's envy. And he saw the wicked have wealth and the righteous be in want. He saw the wicked be honored and the righteous be despised. He saw the wicked get set up and the righteous struggle. And he said, it's just not right. Go ahead and follow through with me now what he says as he begins to describe the wicked as he's looking at it, all right? This is through his eyes. The wicked's description. Verse 4, notice what he says. There are no bands in their death. Their strength is firm. When he says there are no bands in their death, it means they they die, but they don't die hard. They don't have prolonged illnesses. It seems like they die. When he says there's no bands, it means they're not they're not bound to their bed when they die. They seem to die and still have plenty of strength. Their death seems to be a peaceful and smooth transition. Notice what he said in verse five. They're not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. I'm, listen, I, I'm sure there's people listening to me tonight. You're troubled by a bill that's due this week that you don't have money for. You're troubled by maybe a grocery bill that you need to, you need to get some groceries. You're not sure how you're going to do it. Maybe you need to pay the electric. Not sure how you're going to do it. Maybe you have to go to the doctor. And you know that there's a copay you have to get, and you don't know how you're going to get that. I mean, just just ordinary household things that sometimes we struggle with, trying to figure out how we going to how we going to do this, how we going to make the ends meet. He says they don't seem to have those problems. They Asaph, as Asaph looked at it, you know what he said? He said they never seem to get in a tight spot. You ever find yourself in a tight spot? I know college guys never do. You live in a tight spot for about four years is what you'll do. (laughs) Been there, done that. He said they never seem to be that way. In fact, he says in the next verse, notice what he said, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. He said they're 
they, 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 don't, they don't need any jewelry. They wear pride as their adornment. They have a very proud look. They brag of their wealth. They brag about their possessions. They're determined when it says violence, it just means they're determined to get their own way. They're going to climb their ladder of success and if they step on you, too bad for you. They don't care about uh, anybody else's feelings. They don't care who else they hurt. They don't care. They're going to achieve what they're setting out to do. Survival of the fittest. He goes on. Verse 7. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. So you can look at their eyes and tell they're spoiled. They, they, they have more than what they can wish for. Can you imagine that? In other words, he's in, in Asaph's eyes now, he says they wish for hundreds and end up with thousands. They, they simply wish for water, but they get milk. I mean, they, they just always get more than what they wish for. Their things and their possessions surpass their appetites. They just seem to have a lot. There's a... There's, there's, you ever look around? There's a lot of money in this world. There's a lot of people that have money in this world and think nothing of it. He goes on to say, verse 8, they're corrupt. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. Talks about oppression. They speak wickedly. Concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They, they're used to speaking and other people doing what they say. They just say, they, 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 they like to be in control. Verse 9. They set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue walketh through the earth. Now, hey, they're not just talking about others. They're not just speaking lawfully and proud to others. You know what they do? They'll even talk that way to God. They have no regard for Him either. And, and it's not just in one place. It's throughout the earth. He says no matter where you go, you'll find man's the same way. Anywhere you go. They're speaking against God. It's universal. But then they say, in the next verse, Therefore His people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. Asaph says, but it seems to me like God's people return to drink waters of judgment. They tend to see the judgment of God. Now, they, even the wicked say, oh, God chastens you. God comes after you. He, in, he indulges us he lets us do what we want, but boy, he'll get after you. You ever, you ever why wonder, hey, you ever wonder why some people seem to get away with anything they want to do and you just do one little thing or you think something wrong or you don't do something right and man, God just convicts you. And you get, you just say, man, God, I can't get away with anything. No. You're not. I got news for you, fellas. You won't get away with anything. God always finds a way to... Rat you out. Is that a bad word? <laughs> I mean, it just works that way. I, I, I remember, it, it, this was brought home to me in, when I was a sophomore in, in high school. And I grew up in a Christian home, Christian parents. And I had a buddy from school who I played sports with. And he wanted me to go with his dad to a movie that I knew that my dad would not approve me going. So I did what any 15-year-old young man would do. I didn't tell him. And I snuck out with him and went to the movie. And it wasn't a good movie. It's the, and, and, and it's the last time I've been in the movie theater, by the way. And I thought I got away with it. Came home. A couple days went by. And then my dad asked me one day, he said, uh, how was the movie you went to the other week? How does he know? You ready for this? Somebody was there who saw me, who knew my dad. 
You ever, you ever look and say, <laughs> how does that work? How does that work? But you know what God was reminding me of? You're not going to get away with anything. Oh, can you fool? You know, Captain Penny used to be on here. Anybody watch Captain Penny when you were growing up? Fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool mom. Well, we found out that wasn't true, didn't we? You can fool mom and you can fool dad. You cannot fool God. And, and fellas, the Lord taught me something that day. He taught me that, you know what? I'm always seeing what you're doing. And God will always keep you on track. He'll see to it somebody's there. Remember Moses, where he killed that Egyptian? He looked this way and he looked that way, didn't he? Where didn't he look? Huh. God saw what he did. Make sure you're looking up. That's what he was saying here. He's saying, man, I, I, I see God uh, getting on me, but I don't see him getting on the wicked. You ever felt that way sometimes? That's his Asaph's eyes now. All right? He says, hey, go on to say, look at verse 11. They say, how doth God know? Is there knowledge with the Most High? They're saying, you know what? God doesn't know anything. God's unconcerned. God, God is not aware. He's, if he was aware, he'd, he'd do something about it. God's not personal. That's what they want to say. It's interesting. You notice what they call him? They call him the Most High, and they call him God, and then they say he doesn't know. How does that make sense? If he's the Most High and he's God, he knows. That's how foolish it is. That's why when someone says there is no God, the Bible says they're a fool. Foolish, it doesn't make any sense. So he's really struggling. Notice what he said, verse 12. These are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Notice with me verse 13. Here's what Asaph said. Here's, he's beginning to get the solution, but he's still struggling. Notice what he said. Verily I've cleansed my heart in vain. You know what he says? What, I, what am I trying to live right for? Why am I trying to keep my heart clean in the sight of God? What good is it doing me? That's what he's saying. But wait. He said, I've, I've cleansed my heart in vain and marched my hands in innocency. All the day long have I been plagued and I'm chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. He said, man, it, it got to where I didn't even want to think about this. It was too puzzling to me. Why it's so difficult uh, in, in, in the world. Why, have, I, have I done all this for nothing? Have I done all this? And, and, and it seems like everything's upside down. The things that are right, everybody's saying are wrong. And the things that I think we ought to do, nobody says we ought to do. It's just everything's upside down. Everything's turned inside out. But he found the solution in verse 17. Do you see it? It was all too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their what, church? End. How's it going to end? You know what he said? I went into the sanctuary of God. I went to where I got alone with God. I went to where I could spend time alone with Him. It's, it's literally the holy place. It's literally there, the Holy of Holies, the place where God's presence was. Asaph says, my problem was, I'm focused and I'm dwelling on the wicked, and I'm supposed to be focused and dwelling on God. And so I had to go get alone with God. And I had to get alone with Him in the holy place. I had to leave the visible for the invisible. I had to leave the material for the spiritual. I had to shift my... My, my viewpoint from my vantage point to God's vantage point. I had to see things from His perspective. I saw their end. Then I understood. We're not here to live for now. We're living for then. And our end is much different than the end of the wicked. Okay. Notice what he says down in verse 21. 
He says, my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. I was convicted in, in my innermost being. He said, so foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He turns away from the glitter which fascinated him to the gold that was really reality. Don't get distracted by the glitter of the world and miss out on the gold of heaven and the person who we're supposed to be focused on. He said, God is the strength of my heart. God is my portion forever. What do you desire? What is the, what is the passion of your heart? Whom have I in heaven besides thee? It, listen, there's a song that says, Jesus will be what makes it heaven for me. Would you be happy? Would you be satisfied to get to heaven if Jesus wasn't there? Oh, hey man, I got fruit to eat and, you know, streets of gold to walk on and a mansion to live in. Yeah, man, I'm set. Don't you long to see your Savior, first of all? The one who died for you? The one who gave himself for you so you and I wouldn't burn in hell one day? Don't we long to see the one that ever liveth to make intercession for us? Aren't we to, uh, to, he's to be our portion forever? The strength of our heart? This is not all there is, my friend. Paul said, if, if in this life all we have is hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. Now, I'll, I'll submit to you, if there were no heaven, if there were no eternity, if we died and it was just, that's it, we just ceased to exist, I would still want to live a Christian life. I think it's a great life. I believe what we sing on Sunday night, we'll sing at the end of the service tonight. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. And it is. But, but listen to me. This is not all there is. Hey, the wicked better get all they can. They better live it up. They better grab all the gusto because this is all they've got. They're going to die and go to hell. Then I understood their end. Do you think about the end? Listen to me. Fellas, you play a soccer game, and it doesn't, it, you know, it, I'm sure the coach wants you to play well. But the bottom line is, how's it end? When you end, you want to have a W, don't you? Isn't that what you're playing for? Why? Why do they keep score? And by the way, people know me and they know if we're going to play, we're going to keep score. <laughs> but you understand, you're playing for the end result. I'm glad that the Lord gives us grace and peace and joy and love along the with the journey that we're on. But the promise in Romans, I think, or 2 Corinthians, is that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that we'll have over there. William Randolph Hearst, who built the great Hearst Castle out in California, he searched the world for beautiful objects of art to fill it with. Did you know he had a standing rule in his home that no one could mention the word death? He feared to go to sleep every night because he was tormented by the fear of death. For the believer, we need not fear death. It's simply the transition from earth to heaven. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. We're, we sang it tonight. We're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. Don't, don't miss out on that. Look how he ended the song. 
but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all His works. It is good for me to draw near to God. That's an amazing statement. Let me ask you a question tonight. How near are you to God? You know what the answer is? As near as you want to be. As near as you want to be. God says, draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. Who makes the first move? We do. We do. How close do you want to be? And by the way, is it a good thing for you to get as close to God as you can? Yeah. What does James 4.17 tell us? To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So if I'm not as close to God as what I ought to be, then I'm sinning against God. And I, know, and, and I want to take care of that. See, the goal isn't, I want, to see, I want to see, you know, how close I can stay in touch with the world and still reach out to God when I need Him. The goal is, how close can I draw nigh to God? Because you know what happens then? He says, I'll put my trust in the Lord God that I can declare all thy works. You see, the focus now is all where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be on God. It's supposed to keep our eyes on Him. The songwriter said it this way, Oft times the day seems long, Our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch His bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. What number is that in the book, Bob? Do you know? I think it's early. Do you have it? He's going to have it. I thought he'd be all over it, but he wasn't. Page two. How about that? Page two. Will you get that? I think we ought to sing it. Okay? Page number two. Do you have it? Of times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. <coughs> Over in God's eternal day. Now sing it. It will be worth it all. Sing. When we see Jesus. Yes, it will. Life's trials will seem so small. When we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Notice verse 2, sometimes the sky looks dark with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. But there is one in heaven who knows our deepest care. Let Jesus solve your problem. Just go to Him in prayer. The last verse there, Life's day will soon be o'er and all storms forever past. We'll cross the great divide to glory safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven, a harp, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished and we'll lay our burden down. 
It'll be worth it all when you see Christ. I don't know what's going on in the world. We don't know. You know, I don't know. I, I told you, I, I never thought we'd see 2017. I could have. Uh, there's, there's, many a, there's many a preacher that could sell you some prophecy sermons real cheap. Because they all had Jesus coming back by now. They don't know when he's coming back, but I know he's coming. And I know that we, we see things happening that, that surely fit right into what the Bible says will be happening when Jesus returns. And I, I, thought, I thought I'd be back when I was your guy's age. And I'm a little bit older than your guys now. He's not come back yet, but one day he's coming. I know that. We're going to see him. Let's stand together and let's sing that third stanza, shall we? Life's day will soon be o'er. Is that the third? I don't have all. Is that third? Okay. Life's day will soon be o'er, all right? Life's day will soon be o'er. All storms forever past. A will cross the great divide. A true glory safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven. A harp, a robe, a crown. The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burden down. It will be worth it all. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we Father, I pray you'll help us to live the words of that song. Lord, I pray you'll help us to always look at things from your perspective and not get caught up in looking from our point of view. Your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts and your ways are much higher than our ways. Lord, I don't want just a Christian worldview or and I certainly don't want my worldview. I sure would like to have a God worldview. See things the way you see things. Lord, give us the heavenly perspective. Let us value our time in the holy place with you. Our time alone with God and your word to help us to keep our sight and our vision as you would have us see. Let us never be envious at people that are not going to spend eternity with you. Lord, we'll get to be with you forever. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for all you do for us. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. But I wonder tonight, wonder how many believers here this evening and say, Preacher, sometimes I've struggled like Asaph struggled. Looking at the prosperity of the people who don't know God and don't live for God. Looking at my life or other people's lives and know how much we struggle. And sometimes I've wrestled with that myself, Pastor, but, but tonight Psalm 73 has helped me. And I understand what I need is to get to the sanctuary. I need to get alone with God in His Word. It is good for me to draw near to God. I need to see it from God's perspective. I need to keep that, that view in mind. And preacher, tonight the Spirit of God spoke to my heart. Please pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me tonight, Pastor? God bless you. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment I'm going to pray and we're going to have just a brief invitation. Opportunity for you if God has spoken to your heart. You want to respond to him to 
Just take a moment, kneel at an altar, and meet with God before you leave this place this evening. If the Lord has dealt with your heart, then you respond to him tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for hands that have been uplifted, indicating you've spoken to people's hearts. And Lord, I simply pray in these next few moments of invitation, that as you've dealt with their heart, that they would come and respond to what you've asked them to do. And Lord, you'd help us all to see things the way you see things and help us to value our time alone with you that, that keeps us in the right perspective and keeps us focused on the spiritual, not the material. It keeps us focused on the invisible, not the visible. And so, Lord, have your way in each heart and life is my prayer. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, the pianist is going to play. As she begins to play, Bob will sing. The Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Will you please? Nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer to thee. E'en though it be a cross that raiseth me. Oh, <laughs> 